might have seen him on other panels or discussions. He's now the current president of the Atheist Alliance of America. I give you, you're Iran? Aaron. Aaron. How do I can, Iran is like It's a, spelled like Aaron, but pronounced like registered nurse. R-N. I don't want you working on me. <laughs> <laughs> Raw. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. I've got all these bright lights in front of me, and I can't even see you, which is kind of weird. Uh, normally, I would be standing in front of a screen, and this is a little bit, they tell me to sit down, and oh, so this is a little bit different than I'm used to. Anyway, uh, I was, as he said, recently elected uh, atheist or president of Atheist Civil Alliance of America, but I'm also director of the Phylogeny Explorer pro uh, Project. And what that is, if we can work all of the bugs out of the system, and right now it's still a very buggy system, uh, it's going to be a, an attempt or a, a database intended to portray the entire uh, tree of life as a navigable online encyclopedia of zoology and paleontology, paleobiology, and so forth, uh, the systematic classification of life forms, uh, which is the new term for taxonomy. Uh, the uh, systematic, uh, the, um, I mean, how, how am I going to say this? Um, it's now a twin nested hier hierarchy of familial relationships that were originally indicated by morphology and are now uh, cross confirmed or sometimes corrected genetically. And at this point, my team are not doing any of the science ourselves. We're just citing the science that was already done in order to uh, fill up this massive database so that everybody can click through it and put in all of the, uh, the images and the descriptions describing what all of the clades are and why it's important to know this. Um, once it is suitably robust, then we'll start involving experts in various lineages and begin a self-correcting process. The structure is designed to be uh, such that it can take changes at any level which you, you kind of have to with something like this without having to restructure the whole thing. And, um, should, and this is important should new fossils be discovered or should the genetic data reveal any surprises. That has happened a couple of times. Uh, like bats, for example, were once classified, believe it or not, as primates. At least one line of bats were. And then when we got the, uh, the genome completed, we saw that bats actually belonged in a, in a different group than what had been de determined by their morphology alone. However, these are rare occasions because the, uh, the genome also shows that there, or confirms that there is a familial relationship and that the old-timey taxonomists usually mapped that out correctly. Yeah, this is so weird talking to people I can't see. Anyway, yeah, I, I, I know, I can hear them breathing. <laughs> So some other sites have tried to do something like this in the past, but they've run out of funding and they run into various other problems, and we are trying to skirt the problems that undermine those previous projects, and we're taking advantage of the best that they did uh, and kind of building on that. Uh, professional systematists will, uh, will eventually take this over. It's my uh, goal that our project will become a phylogenetic hub, a uh, a fully illustrated resource for both teachers and students and such, and uh, this educational resource will be my contribution to science, and I'm very happy that that's actually becoming a real thing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it, it, it's wonderful to be able to realize something like this. I don't know if anybody uh, saw the 10th Foundational Falsehood of Creationism video that I did. Yeah. yeah. I had hundreds and hundreds of requests for that file folder chart, and that that's where this came from. It turned out that the file folder chart was not actually something we could practically do, you know, but you can still navigate through it. And the best attempt that so far has been made is the Arizona Tree of Life Project, which ran out of funding before they'd even completed the human genome. So there's a lot of updates that need to be done on that. Anyway, um, scientists have discovered several hundred definitely transitional species in the fossil record, but the only way that we know that they are intermediate forms is because of the uh, systematic classification of life forms. Cladistic phylogenetics is the strongest evidence there is of evolution from common ancestor. In fact, it's, such, it's so powerful, so compelling, that it could effectively prove evolution even if we had never found a single fossil. But it's a subject that, strangely, most people don't know anything about at all. Uh, we can, if we can get a bit more Patreon support at patreon.com forward slash A-R-O-N-R-A, 
then uh, we'll also include videos explaining the evolutionary process to make uh, at various clade levels to make this easier for the laity to understand. So, how do you classify life forms? In the simplest form, it's that old Sesame Street game of one of these things is not like the other. In the 1700s, a Christian scientist, Carolus Linnaeus, devised a system of classification by category based on this simple idea. And what he was reportedly trying to do was to identify created kinds, the original forms that God created that you can then derive lesser forms from. If that is what he was trying to do, then he discovered that it was a lot more difficult than he originally imagined. Because what he discovered instead was a descendant lineage of daughter groups nested within a series of ancestral parent groups like a set of Russian Matryoshka dolls, except with each doll having multiple daughters so that it expands out in an ever-widening family. Uh, his system already illustrated a family tree, but he couldn't understand how or why. But it was easy enough to see how some groups were more closely related than others. He estimated a seven-layer grouping, and uh, he gave each rank its own name. Now, we don't use these anymore. There's a different system now that has replaced this. But under his system, these are two different families within the same order. These are two orders within the same taxonomic class. These are different classes within the same phylum. Uh, and now we're talking about different phyla within the same kingdom, and now we're talking about different kingdoms. The more species you see, and the more deeply you look, the more jigsaw puzzles or pieces there are that paint the same picture. And things are a lot more complicated now than it was in the 18th century. But what he saw back then was that these are animals with an internal digestive tract. Uh, these all have lungs and a backbone. These all have fur and mammary glands and these have a suite of more specific characters identifying them in the order carnivora. Uh, each of these characters are now understood to be derived synapomorphies. These are traits that were inherited by descendant groups evolving from a common ancestor that was the first to express that trait. And I understand you guys came here for the taxonomy of dragons. Before I can explain dragons, I have to explain taxonomy, so please bear with me. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Linnaeus lived 100 years before Darwin, and he didn't know anything about mutations or evolution, uh, nor did he think it was even possible for new species to come about by any natural means. So his classification system presented a mystery that he couldn't explain. Why were all these superficial differences being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities? And as I will shortly illustrate, and I have to do this because I'm you know, president of Atheist Alliance of America, so I'm going to talk about atheism stuff. Uh, and, I, and my specialty is arguing against creationism. But taxonomy of what we're talking about um, only works with uh, evolved life forms. This is not what we would expect to see of if everything was specially and magically separately created unrelated to anything else, which is what Linnaeus believed. He then saw a, a, a inexplicable family tree without any understanding of how or why. And the world would have to wait another 100 years for the answer to that question. And now, of course, we see that you know, the evolution from common ancestry is the obvious answer to that riddle. Um, and this system also provides a great deal of evidence against the idea of a common designer. The system only works with evolved organisms, not with created kinds. I'll show you in a moment. For instance, now look at this lizard. This is a Costa Rican cousin of an iguana, sometimes called a Jesus lizard because it can run on water. <laughs> and more commonly, it is, it's actually known as a basilisk. Now, you Harry Potter fans probably think of something else when you hear the word basilisk. According to a team of expert herpetologists, there are some 9,400 species of lizards, including snakes. Snakes are actually a subset of lizards. And uh, these include the forest dragon, water dragons, bearded dragons, flying dragons, raise your hand if you didn't know about these. Oh, everybody knows about these. <laughs> and of course, the Komodo dragon. Now, these are all available as pets. Any of, you, any of you could have any of these in your house right now. But most people in the world, almost everyone, will think of something else entirely if you tell them that you have a dragon in your garage. Amusingly, though, if you say that you like dragons, no one thinks you're talking about any of these, but no one can agree on what a dragon is either. 
about the only thing they can agree on is that dragons are the most magnificent monsters that never existed. And they would still tell you that even if you've shown them all of these things. Because all, although all of these are real, tangible things that we can prove exist, we don't look at these mere lizards as if they're really dragons, just like we don't look at this lizard like it's really a monster. Now, I like to define my terms, but I can't be sure what a monster is. The dictionary says it's an animal or plant of abnormal form or structure. In which case, what about this? My wife has one of these as a pet. It's a Mexican axolotl. The fronds on the back of its neck are actually external gills, though it has lungs too. Uh, this fish with feet is sort of a transitional species. It's also an endangered species, only uh, found in one lake system in Mexico. Uh, and, um, but this one is also a mutant in that it never matures. It can reproduce sexually, but it remains in the nymph stage its entire life. And this gives it the ability, this mutation gives it the ability to uh, regrow severed limbs, which is both cool and creepy. They're normally a dark mottled gray, though many are albino, but this one is also genetically engineered so that it glows green under a black light. Yeah, um, but they injected green fluorescent protein from a jellyfish into its genome. However, they discovered that black light causes its stress somehow. So if you get one of these things, they caution that you shouldn't be subjected to more than a couple of seconds of black light at a time, which I think is interesting. The dictionary also implies that a monster should be of unnatural origin, and this is a transgenic GMO. It doesn't even have a species name. It's called a GFP. Somebody got a Nobel Prize for this. They got a Nobel Prize for making this lizard fish. <laughs> it can't exist in nature and had to be art artificially engineered in a laboratory. You know, you can't get much more unnatural than that, right? So while I can honestly say that we have a bioengineered bio mutant monster in our house, most people wouldn't call it a monster, not unless we made a really big one and it got into the lakes and started eating teenagers when they go skinny dipping. <laughs> now imagine them having to use a black light to fend this thing off, you know, like turning a, turning a sun lamp on a vampire, the same kind of a thing. So when I looked these up, the first comment I saw was that people said that they look like dragons, but at this tiny size, we would not accept them as either dragons or monsters. Ideally, monsters should be big, ugly, dangerous, powerful, and big. These are monsters. I think we can all agree that these are definitely monsters, and we finally have a definition to prove that. They are big, ugly, dangerous organisms of unnatural origin. But are they both dragons? Now, everyone accepts King Ghidorah as a dragon, but um, they don't accept Godzilla as one. Why not? Not all dragons have wings, right? And uh, doesn't his... Atomic breath count as breathing fire. Not all dragons do that either, but I thought only dragons did that. And I think Godzilla should count as a dragon because he doesn't fit anywhere else. Uh, notice that in some depictions, he has mammal-like features like a nose, differentiated teeth, and external ears. And this blend of mammalian and reptilian features is common for oriental dragons, and he is Japanese. Uh, Toho Pictures said that Godzilla was supposed to be a mutant, uh, mutated dinosaur, but he doesn't look like a dinosaur. He looks like a giant lizard, as if the eggs of this marine iguana were subjected to huge doses of radiation and mutated. And of course, this was the idea that TriStar Pictures used when they said that Godzilla is actually a lizard, but strangely, they changed his appearance so that he looks like a dinosaur. Then Warner Brothers did it, and they said, well, it's not a lizard or a dinosaur. Now they say it's a god but nobody calls it a dragon. So what is this suite of features that identifies whether something is a dragon or not? Why is this thing a dragon when it doesn't even have a breath weapon and Godzilla has death breath and he's not a dragon, yet Falcor is a dragon? <laughs> His only weapon is dog breath. So there is no biological definition for a dragon unless we're only talking about lizards. Otherwise, a dragon is a mythical monster that may or may not be reptilian and may or may not breathe fire. And the only thing that we know for sure about it is that it is mythical. 
and therein lies the problem. If we try to categorize dragons taxonomically, as some have tried to do, then the problem we immediately encounter is that they don't fit anywhere in a cladogram. The guy that drew this cladogram uh, nested them in vertebrates or vertebrata as if they had evolved directly from fish-like forms, but he didn't nest them in reptiles? Uh, why not? And uh, it, he couldn't be more specific than that. And then he, he does, where they're not descended from dinosaurs, but some of them have feathers and some of them look like mammals. Now, the way the feathers developed, you know, develop in the embryo, or yeah, yeah, is uh, it mirrors the way that they have seen, been seen to develop in the fossil record in a sequence of increasingly bird-like dinosaurs. Uh, feathers are so complex that it would be statistically impossible for the same structure to evolve twice into unrelated organisms. So dragons with feathers would either have to be descended from dinosaurs with feathers or they would have to be special creations. Now, of course, I always have the argument about people saying, you know, the common, com this isn't evidence of a common ancestor, this is evidence of a common designer, and, you know, and that's what they're arguing for, but no, uh, such is not the case. This is the difference between an evolved species and a created kind. Evolution has a set of natural laws that it has to follow, and that's how we trace the ancestry of living things. But trying to categorize intelligent designs would be like trying to categorize automobiles or motor vehicles. I mean, any company can build a pickup truck or a motorcycle, and these things are not going to be related. And so any comparisons that you make aren't going to be meaningful. Created things don't have derived synap synapomorphies because they don't inherit anything, because a creator can decide that he wants this one to have bat's wings and that one to have feathers or no wings or tentacles or whatever the hell he wants, and it would all be arbitrary affectations according to whim, and there would be no way to make any determinable lineage. If you're going to categorize any collective, you must first identify that grouping by the total tally of traits that are already carried by everything that is universally accepted to be part of that group without making special exceptions for certain ones before you can decide whether some new addition really belongs there. This is how uh, their traits become diagnostic and directly indicative of unique groups. But in this cladogram, there are bird dragons and mammal dragons and reptilian dragons with no relationship either to each other or to anything else. So according to this cladogram, the word dragon is polyphyletic. And I'll give another explanation. In the old Linnaean system, uh, that was paraphyletic because the family tree arbitrarily excluded certain descendants. Some of the descendants were fish, of fish weren't fish anymore, they were amphibians. Some of the amphibians weren't amphibians anymore, they were reptiles. Some of the reptiles weren't reptiles anymore, they were either mammals or they were birds. That's paraphyletic. Now that we understand this better, we know it's not really like that. At one point, our ancestors were amphibious, but they were not amphibians, because amphibians is a relatively recent clade, which includes frogs and salamanders, but does not include any of our ancient ancestors. Uh, likewise, our ancestors were carnivorous, but they were never the members of the order carnivora, where we have, you know, uh, lions and tigers and hyenas and so forth. Our family, or our, yeah, our family arose alongside them, not from them. The words fish and reptile, this is another stickler that throws people, no longer have any taxonomic meaning because they don't have any consistent definitions at least not by character traits the way they used to be. There are fish who don't have scales or fins, and some that can even warm their blood. And there are uh, fossil creatures that have internal gills, but aren't what anybody would recognize or accept as a fish anymore. So we class them by their ancestry instead, which is the only consistent way to do it. You identify them by their traits, but you're still classifying them by their ancestry, their phylogeny. Some fish don't even have backbones, but they are all chordates. And everything descended from them is a chordate. Uh, that's monophyletic, the ideal method of classification, where all the descendants are still included in that family. Then it doesn't matter if you lose any of those traits either. For example, humans are classified as tetrapods, meaning that you have four limbs, right? Two arms, two legs. But if you're born without any of these appendages, you're still a tetrapod, you're still a human, you're still everything your parents were because you came from them. You can never grow out of your ancestry. Uh, we are not fish anymore. And by the way, that's one of the laws of evolution. There are several. Uh, you're not a fish anymore because fish doesn't really mean anything cladistically, but you're still chordates. And that's the difference between a inapplicable character grade and a phylogenetic clade. Likewise, what Linnaeus called a reptile 
was a cold-blooded, four-legged animal with claws and scales, but we know exceptions to that too that are universally considered to be reptiles. There are reptiles that don't have claws or scales or even limbs on occasion. And so that, that type of classification doesn't work anymore. That and reptile has been redefined so that uh, it, it's any member of the order Diapsidae or uh, so, and this, we are synapses, and these are different classifications based on differences in the structure of the skull, and these apparently diverged at about the same time, so that even if our family, our ancestors were at one point cold-blooded scaly things with claws, they were never reptiles because they were never part of that other family that branched away from ours. I hope that makes some sense to you. Okay, so um, polyphyletic is best illustrated by dragons. The water dragon, bearded dragon, and flying dragons are among hundreds of, of species of lizards in the family Agamidae, only some of which are called dragons. Now, in a monophyletic system, all of them would be dragons. I mean, you would have an original dragon, and then everything else that descends from that would be a dragon. And if it didn't descend from a dragon, then it's not a dragon, um, if there was ever a dragon to start with. But the Komodo dragon comes from a completely different family, Varanidae where nothing else is called a dragon except the Komodo, which again, it, it's, that's paraphyletic again. Uh, but we have polyphyletic because it's now two different origins with no common ancestor that was a dragon itself. The irony is that Varanids, also known as monitor lizards, are the real dragons, and I'll explain why shortly. Another irony is that the reason that Mushu says that he is not a dragon is the very reason he should be as we'll soon see. A better example of dragon taxonomy is this one. I drew this cladogram in the original style that was in use in the 20th century when taxonomists were restricted to text-based representations. Uh, it's based on an article titled A Complete and Scientific Classification of Cinematic Dragons. And it was written by someone claiming to be a director of dragon studies with a doctorate in draconia. I think he may be exaggerating somewhat. <laughs> As you can see, research citations have been replaced with movie citations where you would normally see the names of scientists and their date of publication. You see the names of film directors and their date of release. If you read the article, you'll see that most of these categories are determined by, by what the dragon does rather than what it is. Uh, there is no interest in physical characteristics, but rather whether it is intelligent, whether it can talk, or whether it is helpful, evil, or greedy. <laughs> which is a bit like classifying apes, dolphins, and elephants in the same category as parrots and ravens because they're all smart, <laughs> despite the fact that they couldn't be much more different otherwise. It's rather like when the Bible says that bats are birds because they can fly, and where elsewhere it says that bats are locusts because they swarm. It's, and the same, for the same reason that they say that you know, whales are fish, because they're basing it on what they do, not what they are. Uh, this cladogram also reminds me of how early scientists approached taxonomy. They were very superficial in the early days, uh, and they used to think that surface features were more important than the underlying structure. And without the concept of evolution, they had some very strange ideas about where these successive generations came from. For example, Sir Richard Owen was the leading expert in the world at the time that he invented the word dinosaur in 1842, but he had this strange belief that ancient species would wear out over time and would be replaced by new and improved models. As if God could improve his skills with practice through trial and error, in the same way that human engineers do. Owen was convinced that dinosaurs were cold-blooded, sluggish, lumbering beasts, and that uh, the, the iguanodons were essentially recalled by the factory and replaced with sheep and cows, and that uh, theropod carnivores were retired when God came out with his new line of lions and tigers and bears. The idea that dinosaurs might have been faster and more efficient and better adapted than mammals, um, when, this, when evidence of this came to light, it threw Owen into a tizzy of science denial, which is pretty bad since he was the world's leading authority. And looking at this chart, you'll see a series of subgroups within parental groups, so it looks like an evolutionary cladogram, uh, where all the types of dragons are divided into two main categories. Now, the, uh, the self-professed draconologist who composed this grouping admits that the mystical forms, I don't know if you can see those up at the top, I'd intended actually to point at them, but you know, obviously they it sat my ass here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, the guy, the guy that assembled this grouping said that the mystical forms were so magical that they defied classification, but his mundane forms defy classification too. Uh, look down toward the bottom, you'll see a, a subgrouping called Peregrinidae that is represented by Ghidorah, the three-headed monster. This category is described as the grouping of dragons that come from outer space. <laughs> In other words, multiple types of dragons with independent origins and from different sources and absolutely no familial relationship at all. You can't get any more polyphyletic than that. And that negates the purpose of there even being a cladogram, since it can't represent any sort of uh, taxonomic phylogeny. Calling something a dragon, then, means no, nothing more than calling something brown. Which leads me to the next source of dragon taxonomy, ye old Dungeons and Dragons monster manual. <laughs> this is the set that I had in high school back in the day that if you played Dungeons and Dragons and your character got to a high enough level, you would be inducted into a coven of witchcraft. <laughs> now obviously these books were written for a world with no evolution in it. This was not a world of natural processes, this was a god of God, or this is a world realm of gods and magic. So their classification of dragons fully expects and accepts that they are created beings. In the D&D world, dragons are again divided into two main categories, and again, it's on the most superficial criteria. In this case, whether they are chromatic or whether they are metallic. And whichever, uh, the, the good ones, or the, the, the chromatic ones are the good ones, and the colored ones are the bad ones, and whichever color they are determines what their breath weapon is, among other things. As a taxonomist myself, I would classify dragons by their physical traits. I too would divide them into two main categories, but I think that the greatest division is between the eastern dragons and the western dragons, and then I would discuss the major divisions on each side. For example, this species is Vermithrax pejorative, one of a family of waverns that has been depicted in Dragon Slayer, Lord of the Rings, Reign of Fire, and Game of Thrones. Waverns are a typical example of a western dragon, as you can see, most dragons uh, that we think of in the modern Western world would, or should if they were real, be more similar to lizards than to dinosaurs because dragons that look like dinosaurs are atypical anomalies and generally not taken seriously. <laughs> Most of the famous ones are much more lizard-like, as we see again with this wavering species known by his binomial taxonomic name of Smaug giganteus. Waverns are identified by one of, two, one of a few traits that actually make sense in taxonomy, the fact that they are tetrapods, they have four limbs, and that they, uh, when they're on the ground, they go about on their wings the same way that bats or pterosaurs would. And you can see the evolution of dragons just by looking at Smaug. Uh, let's see, here he is as a 21st century wavern. But back in the 1970s, Smaug was a hexapod with six limbs, having two legs, two arms, and two wings. Uh, hexapod vertebrates would be impossible anywhere in natural taxonomy. Uh, it used to be that western dragons were commonly depicted with four legs and two wings, and they often have uh, long, strong legs that are, and, and they are most often the ones depicted as steeds to be ridden. Uh, hexapods were once the most common form of dragon seen in movies, but are now relatively rare and usually only appear in children's stories. A third type of western dragon, as I understand it, is the worm, that's W-Y-R-M, or serpent, represented here by Jorgenmunder, the Midgard serpent of Norse mythos. Although it is called a serpent, it's not actually a snake. It's only superficially snake-like. It's a bit like the basilisk in Harry Potter, uh, in that you call it a snake, but it's not really a snake. There are legless lizards, or li lizards with greatly diminished legs, that look a lot more like this than any snake. Calling this thing a snake is a bit like calling a koala a bear. <laughs> uh, and the worm, or serpent, is the oldest form of dragon and is both literally and figuratively the source of every other depiction of dragons throughout folklore. Sometimes with wings and no legs, sometimes with legs and no wings, but always very serpentine and uh, ne yet never just a snake. Uh, notice that the legs are never great powerful limbs either. They're, they're spindly, sometimes unnecessary affectations and attachments to a serpentine body. And this cladogram shows the crown or the mother of dragons in the generalized shape of a lizard or crocodile, and this is, uh, this is appropriate. On my arm is a tattoo of a Nordic dragon, 
And my wife has a matching tattoo of an oriental dragon. You can say that mine is a western dragon and hers is an eastern dragon. Uh, but they'll note that the, the form of both of them is that of the worm. They are both serpents. And one of the laws of evolution is that the further back in time you, you uh, look at any phylogenies or distantly related species, the more similar they will appear to be. And the same is true of dragons. While western dragons branched into waverns and hexapods, Eastern dragons kept their worm or serpent shape as represented by Manda here, another one of Toho's monsters. Manda is a perfect example of an oriental dragon. And if you look closely, you'll see that the eastern dragons started growing hair and whiskers. Oriental dragons became increasingly mammalian, sometimes looking like Chinese lions, and one branch of them seemed to have been trying to turn into dogs. And this is better illustrated by Haku from the movie Spirited Away who looks very much like a snaky dog, just like Falcor in The NeverEnding Story. So, it seems that I've adequately categorized a taxonomy of dragons, or so I thought until I came across this thing. <laughs> what the fuck is this? <laughs> um, it... It's, it's a lion with wings. That's, that's not a dragon, that's a griffin. And I think that's why they dyed it green, so that you wouldn't notice that it's just a griffin. It's completely mammalian, which doesn't make sense for a western uh, dragon, but it's also a hexapod, which doesn't make sense for an eastern dragon. And this is why systematic classification only works with evolving phylogenies and not with created kinds. Every time we've ever invented a fictional creature for stories or movies or whatever, or in this case a video game, they never fit into taxonomy, even when they're supposed to. They always violate the laws of phylogeny, because a creator can conjure anything he wants for any reason or none. Creations are arbitrary, with no derived or inherited traits, and consequently defy classification. And you already know the dragons are made up, or hopefully you should, but they didn't just come from our imagination. So what inspired that image? Where did the idea of dragons come from? The earliest mention of dragons comes from the Bible where the book of Job describes Leviathan. Now some people think that Leviathan is supposed to be a whale, but no, it's a crocodile. This is a Nile crocodile. It's, uh, yeah, it's the second largest species in the world, and this one is a big one, to be sure. It's, it's, this one is as big as a saltwater croc, but remember that the average length for this species is 16 feet, and there are a number of 20-footers confirmed in captivity. This one has yet to be confirmed in, in, in the measurement, but somebody I read is going to that wall to, to measure it out. Uh, if that turns out to be what I think it is, with probably 23, 24 feet, it may be as big as some of the, uh, the, the saltwater crocs can get. But uh, these are in Africa, not in Australia, as the saltwater crocs are. Now imagine that you're living in the Bronze Age. You're barely five foot tall. You have a sharpened stick for a spear, and your sword is a fairly blunt and crudely made chunk of bronze. And you're expected to take this on. The book of Job describes Leviathan as a scaly reptilian thing with legs dragging itself through the mud. It says Leviathan is a huge, powerful, yet graceful monster whose mouth is set like, his mouth is like a great set of doors ringed by fearsome teeth. Doors would be a good way to describe this, wouldn't it? His back has rows of shields so, uh, sealed so tightly together, each so close to the next, that no air can pass between. They are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. I think that's a good description of his backside, don't you think? And then it says that the underside are jagged pot shards, leaving a trail in the mud like a threshing sledge. The way Job describes it, we're, we're clearly talking about an actual animal here. It says, if you lay a hand on him, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. Any hope of subduing him is false. The mere sight of him is overpowering. When he rises up, the mighty are terrified. They retreat before his thrashing. The sword that reaches him has no effect, nor does the spear or the dart or the javelin. Iron he treats like straw and bronze like rotten wood. 
Arrows do not make him flee. Sling stones are like chaff to him. A club seems to him a piece of straw. He laughs at the rattling of the lance. He makes the depths churn like a boiling cauldron and stirs up the sea like a pot of ointment. Behind him he leaves a glistening wake. Nothing on earth is his equal, a creature without fear. Before giving any description at all, Job 41 begins by asking his audience questions like, can you draw out Leviathan from a, with a fish hook? Will you play with him as with a bird or put him on a leash for your girls? So it seems that when these parables and poems first became popular, that they were talking about an animal that people had seen themselves and were familiar with. And then they personified it to make it the granddaddy of all such beasts. And then it seems that there was some embellishment done because people always have to exaggerate. And uh, they, they said somewhere in there that it also breathes fire. And I don't know what this uh, tendency is for exaggeration. If you look at this picture, there is no doubt that this is a huge animal. The people behind it didn't have to be 10 feet behind it. And they didn't have to be sitting down to try to create the illusion that it was bigger than it was. That would have been an impressive picture if they were standing next to it to show its real size. But people got to make shit up. <laughs> now, now, even though some Bible scholars admit that scripture is clearly describing a crocodile, I've been criticized for pointing this out because of the interpretation that it's just got to be something else. Some think it has a long neck because one verse says he sees everything that is high. Well, of course he does, with his, just his eyes sticking out of the water. If you get down too low, he might not be able to see you again. And yes, this guy's pissing his pants right now. <laughs> you can just see he's so confident that it's like, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. <laughs> now, some people argue that Psalms 1474 says that the Leviathan has multiple heads, but it doesn't say that. If you read the verse just before it, you'll see that they're talking about multiple animals in plural, not just one. I understand that over the centuries people have mythologized this thing, but it really was evidently just a crocodile to begin with. Uh, then when the story got passed into the Mediterranean and to New Europe, where, you know, places where there were no crocodiles and people no longer understood what this thing was supposed to be, and this turned into this. Importantly, though, even though it says Leviathan has legs, the Bible calls it a dragon and a serpent. The book of Isaiah also refers to Leviathan as both dragon and serpent. The book of Revelations says that the devil is a dragon, albeit one with seven heads. And the same verse also calls him a serpent, but one that it can apparently stand because it's described him as standing on the beach. Um, Genesis Never says that the serpent in the garden is a dragon, but it does imply that it might have had legs at one point because he was cursed to crawl around on his belly for all time. And Genesis never refers to the serpent in the garden as the devil either. There was no option for him to grow a half a dozen extra heads and then go stand on the beach. Uh, that's one of the ways that we know that the serpent in the garden can't be the same character as Satan. The serpent was cursed to crawl on his belly for all time, but the first time we see Satan mentioned by name is in a story chronologically after this one, and he's described as walking around and chatting with God as if they'd never had a falling out. Uh, it's also important to note that many of the artists of the Renaissance depicted the serpent not as Satan, but as a woman. Here we see it on the, uh, the Cathedral of Notre Dame. So was this ever representative of mainstream Catholicism at that time? Michelangelo painted the same thing on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel at the Vatican. You can't get much more mainstream than that, so it would seem that that was the official interpretation, though this was a, one of those biblical interpretations that is never written down anywhere. Uh, much like the serpent being Satan, that's not actually in Scripture. People just interpret it that way. Similarly, People also interpret the Talmud much the same way. So this character is supposed to be, according to Talmudic legend, the serpent of the garden is supposed to be the dark maid Lilith from the Epic of Gilgamesh. And she dwelt in the Hulapu tree with the serpent who could not be tamed. In that story, they're clearly just talking about a snake. And that's the serpent that was apparently adapted into the fable now known as Genesis. There is no overlap between the serpent and Satan. They have different fates in unconnected stories because this is a forced blend of two different characters. The Satan, Hashatan, was adapted from the ancient Persian belief in Araman the Opposer, represented either as a beast 
or in a later incarnation as an angel and the patron deity of the Yazidi people. Most versions of Jeremiah and Ezekiel translate dragon to mean monster, but the, you know, the description could be talking about a snake, but there are also times when the Bible mentions serpents and does not equate them to dragons. So it appears that the serpent isn't always a snake, but is sometimes a very serpentine creature, which may or may not have legs or wings. And I probably should have categorized the fact that this one has two sets of wings on top of its two legs. So there's an octopod. There's another category I missed. So this is one of the earliest depictions of a dragon. And it turns out that most of the references to dragons in, the, in medieval literature, whether they're in scripture or uh, any other document, are referring to snake-like things like this. And many of them refer to a specific group of lizards that are most closely related to snakes. The most famous example is St. George slaying the dragon. Depictions of this beast vary wildly, and some of them give it mammalian features like external ears, as shown here. Uh, sometimes they have fur, sometimes they have bat's wings, like this one does. And notice that the bat's wings are not big enough to fly with. They're apparently still developing. We can consider this an evolutionary transition. Yeah, uh, and we'll see more of that in a moment. Uh, the, this sort of chimera uh, is another evolutionary impossibility. But it usually looks about like this, like a very big lizard. And can you see the tongue darting out? Because that's important, remember that. Here's a slightly more realistic relief from the 16th century showing that uh, this really is nothing but a big lizard. And I'll superimpose that with another realistic rending to give you a, the scale. Um, again, we see the tongue darting out, indicating that this is a varanid, a giant monitor lizard. This is a family of very large and dangerous uh, long-necked lizards from the tropics. And they, these include the Komodo dragon. Uh, it's important to note that St. George was not in Europe when he encountered this dragon. He was in Libya, which is in North Africa, and they actually do have lizards this size. This is a Nile monitor, the species George would most likely have encountered. All monitors are mildly venomous with an anticoagulant saliva. And again, if you're five foot tall, living in the Bronze Age, and you don't have regular housing and such to sleep in, and you end up getting bit by one of these things, um, if it gets a good bite on you and manages to work it in, they hang, they hang on for 20 minutes or so and thrash around and make the wound really nasty. And then when it finally lets go and you try to run away, before you black out from blood loss, the last thing you see is a whole bunch of these things crawling up at you like this to tear you apart. These grow about as long as I am tall, but as we said, uh, you know, most people didn't uh, grow that tall at that age. So a, um, if you looked at a suit of armor from that period, you know, these were not big guys. So St. George, probably a foot shorter than me. So a better illustration would be this Malaysian water monitor. These things are seven feet long, enormously powerful, and eat children. Uh, lizards of this size or bigger are man-eaters. As an amateur herpetologist familiar with these things, I've had a few of them as pets, and I do not recommend it. <laughs> but I can tell you that these are remarkably accurate renderings of monitor lizards, except that the monitors, the varanids, are the only lizards that have the forked tongue, like a snake has. And it's only supposed to have two prongs. Maybe something like this is, you know, can escape detection when you just look at it at a glance, or maybe if you're not trained to study such things. But we see this motif being repeated again and again and again as one artist copies another artist. And they don't, and it's like somebody didn't bother to say, you know, that's only a tongue and it should only have two prongs because they keep adding prongs to it until it doesn't look like a tongue anymore. What does it look like? Fire. Bingo. Then we get to this thing. This was obviously done by somebody who had never seen one of these lizards and didn't know that it was supposed to be a lizard. And that's definitely not a tongue coming out of its mouth. It could be a bale of hay, but I'm, I'm guessing, you know, maybe he's like smoking an entire carton of cigars. But uh, it looks like he's got Godzilla breath. And I'm taking that guess by the fact that he's also against a backdrop of flaming destruction. So, um, and then we look at what that led to. Here we have another giant monitor, even further exaggerated. Now it's bigger than people, and it has both a tongue and fire. And I don't know if you can see the small point, but it, it, wrong about the third line of that text, it should say that it is both a, it, they call it both a serpent and a dragon. And there, there were varanids this big 
uh, in Australia around uh, 20,000 years ago, but of course this artist didn't know that. Uh, this artist drew it with the mammalian features, again, the external ears and such, because he didn't know it was supposed to be a lizard. And apparently this one is afraid of drowning, and that's why it's wearing water wings. Um, <laughs> But again, you know, this is, this is the, the barest beginnings of those wings. And comparing that to that other image, we see that it'll develop into slightly larger wings and, of course, become full and flight wings later on. And the, this is how dragons evolved, in a sense, in our folklore. And the classic image of a fire-breathing dragon actually began as a tongue-lashing lizard, and we've exaggerated extrapolated that to give flight to a race of gargantuan gods of fire and lightning bolts. I submit that uh, these uh, imagined embellishments based on uh, misinformed misunderstandings are how we've composed, conceived, contrived, and conjured all of our gods and monsters. I thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so somebody would, had mentioned doing a Q&A. I don't know how much time. How much time do we have? Uh, oh, good, good. Yes, sir. Hi, I'll make this quick. Uh, my name's Sean. I am a huge fan of you. Uh, I first discovered your uh, 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 foundational falsehoods of creationism. And uh, ever since then, I've been subscribed to your channel, and I love your current uh, uh, living science videos. Thank you so much. Um, I know a lot about you in your activism and uh, in your public life, but I'm very curious as to your hobbies. Like, uh, what, like, what do you do for fun? Like, obviously you play D and D, uh, and you know you seem kind of like a nerd like us. And I was wondering, uh, like, tell us about your hobbies and you know what you like to do for fun, and perhaps maybe give us a telling of maybe one of your favorite characters that you played from D and D. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not, yeah. I, I remember talking to a friend of mine saying, you know, you, do you remember this time when we were sitting on the sofa just saying, you know, is there nothing on? That was a long time ago for me. You know, the things that I do for entertainment, I don't really anymore. I, am, I, I, I do this, and I, 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 I'm doing I'm do it full time now. But I mean, honestly, and my schedule is all over the place. I mean, I, I might go to bed at 10 o'clock in the morning and get up at four in the afternoon and then continue on. But basically, I sit down on my keyboard and I, I write scripts or I record audiobook or or I I, I prepare for that. You, you you don't have any idea how how bad the workload is at this moment. A month from now, I'm going to be doing a a 19 city tour a driving tour, like as a book tour, and then I've got another presentation that I have to write for that, as well as recording the audio book, as well as I have to do a, a, like a 10 other videos. And there's no way to do, this is my hobby. And so I'm, I'm delighted that this is my full-time gig because I did have a job prior to this that I absolutely hated. <laughs> I was there for 14 years, and it got increasingly restrictive so that I couldn't do any of my activism anymore until I get home. And I remember having an argument with my boss just before he wanted to fire me that um, I said that my job interferes with my work. Yes. Yeah, and so I want to bring up that I am now, the reason that I can do this full time is that I'm on Patreon, and I'm, I'm, it's, not, it's not great money, but it's enough that I, can, that I don't have to have a job like that anymore. So thank you, everybody, to, and once again, patreon.com forward slash A-R-O-N-R-A. <laughs> I need all the help I can get. But thank you for that question. And don't get personal. <laughs> yes, sir. So was there a single event or at least a series of events that sparked you into getting into the taxonomy and just wanting to know like why things are organized and the study of that? Or how did you come to being so involved in taxonomy? Oh, thank you for that question. Yeah, this was the one that probably caused the rift with my family when I was uh, in first grade. They didn't bother indoctrinating me uh, because Mormons have this thing where you, you're not supposed to indoctrinate your children until they're eight years old, which gives them a chance. And by then, my science teacher had given me a book on dinosaurs, and it just happened to have a cladogram in it. 
and when I saw how dinosaurs and birds and, and, and all of these things were, were related in the very primitive cladogram that they had at that time, it just made perfect sense. So by the time they came to the indoctrination stage, and they said, well, look, this is the absolute truth of God. And I was like, no, it isn't. See, look what he says here. And it, <laughs> it was too late. Yeah. Yes? OK, so um, my question is actually about how someone can use like you talked a little bit about how the Bible describes, you know, Leviathan and whatnot. And there's been a spate of articles from creationists that say that this is evidence that dinosaurs live with man. Um, what is your best example of how to counter these claims? Because I keep seeing these things pop up and I've had like people that I'm very close to show me like enlarged skulls and huge dinosaur bones and said, well, you know, dinosaurs live with men, so therefore evolution is false. Yeah. Um, that, even if dinosaurs, even if there were some dinosaurs that still were around that weren't birds, because, I mean, I'm, you know, birds are still around, that doesn't mean that evolution is false. There's a lot of things that we can use to demonstrate that. But when you talk about you know, the, the examples that they use from the Bible, so I've given you the physical description of, of, of Leviathan. It's clearly describing a crocodile. There's not a dinosaur that fits this description, uh, not that would still also be in water. And another one that they like to bring up is behemoth. And there's a passage in the behemoth, you know, but everything about the behemoth describes an elephant. <laughs> everything, including the fact that he has a nose that pierceth snares. Not a horn on his nose, the nose pierceth snares. And he is chief in the ways of God because he's so intelligent. Read every passage about that. If you were aware already that it's describing an elephant, that's describing an elephant. You know, my favorite one is the, is the, um, the unicorn. Because the Bible does talk about a unicorn, but the way that it describes a unicorn is not the way that we have been conditioned in culture to believe in unicorns. Unicorns are supposed to be these diminutive little magical horses that hang out with young ladies, and they're all so meek and cute and everything. But the way the Bible describes it is it's this massively powerful, untamable beast that supposedly doesn't have much intelligence to it. And then you realize that the Latin name uh, for uh, the rhinoceros is unicornus. For the, in, the Indian rhino, that's literally what it is. So the Bible's referring to a freaking rhino. <laughs> I'm, I know that, that, that destroys some fantasy movies right there. But <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Hey, um, uh, I'm a big fan of yours. I love your channel. I spent a lot of time on YouTube, and I noticed they've been like demonetizing a lot of videos that they deem advertised or unfriendly. Are you, like, have you been victim to that, or are you, are you worried that like skeptic stuff is going to take a hit like people who make their money living, making videos that people would deem controversial or don't want to advertise their toothpaste over or whatever. I'm just starting to hear about that. So, no, it hasn't hit me yet. Uh, I mean, I, I got noticed that somebody was downloading all of my videos and all of a number of other people's videos and then putting them up on their own channel and then monetizing them. And I don't, I don't need, should I do something about that? Because I want the information, I'm primarily an activist. You know, I don't want it to be at my own cost. I just want the information to get out there. But it makes me wonder if I should take action on something like that. And I don't know what, you know, it, it, people have started raising noise about what's happening with the skeptic community, both on YouTube and on Facebook, that we're somehow being targeted. I haven't yet seen that evidence myself. So I, I can't comment on it. Yes, sir. So it seems like you're classifying dragons as, it seems, fire-breathing lizards there. What consideration are we taking for fire-breathing, rocket-powered turtles? <laughs> Gamera is really neat. He is made of turtle meat. Oh. <laughs> I loved Gamera as a kid. But you know, just think about it. If, if you've ever, never seen the movie, right? he pulls in his back legs and these huge rocket engines turn on. And see, he's a turtle. It, and he has teeth, not just little teeth, he has huge tusks. And turtles don't have teeth, but he has huge tusks that come up from the bottom. He looks really badass like that. But he, his rocket power, but that's not his normal mode of flight. His normal, if for long distance, well, why would you ever do this for long distance? For the long distance, he pulls in his arms and his head and his tail, because he's an alligator snapping turtle that happens to fly. And when he pulls in everything, then his arm holes also become engines. And this throws him into a spin, so he, that he becomes a flying saucer. <laughs> And in this mode, he can travel between planets. 
<laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you talked about how the depiction of Western dragons evolved. Uh, what would you say about the depiction of Eastern dragons? Is it similar enough that it wasn't worth mentioning? Oh, I did mention it. The Eastern dragons are you know, become more and more mammalian. They remain they remain in the uh, the serpentine. Mm -hmm. They remain worms, uh, but they. They, they have these all these mammalian features, and then the, this one line of them becomes so magical that they end up being dog-like, and that was Haku, and that was uh, uh, Falcor, and these are the ones that just fly through the air without need of wings, you know? Beautiful things, a nice rendering, but it's, it, and they're, they're very different from the Western interpretation of the dragon. Western dragons generally tend to be malevolent and evil, whereas the Eastern dragons look extremely different and have a completely different temperament. Yes. So um, what is your position on the what is your position on the origin of uh, fairies and pixies like flying spirits, flying magical spirits in the air? A lack of imagination. <laughs> uh, people People associate whatever they know. So when they make up mythical animals, they'll just like do like a mix, mix and match, like a griffin. Well, we've got an eagle, we've got a lion. Let's just put them together, you know. And and we've got a, a centaur. Well, that's you know a man with a, a horse's body. And uh, the, the harpy. We got the woman with the eagle body. And then we've got the hip. The, what was it? Not hippocampus, but the manticore. Was just let's just throw a whole bunch of shit into one animal and have three heads and two tails, and it fires rockets. At least it's not a flying turtle. <laughs> But you, you, so they invent elves and fairies and and what, what gnomes and gods and all of these things that again have human attributes because the only way that they can figure that anything happens is not a natural process because somebody did it. So lack of imagination and it's not really you know it, you, you can't really blame people for like that because imagine trying to create an original life form for like a science fiction idea right? Come up with something original. You will end up copying a mollusk or an insect or go as bizarre as you want and you're still copying something that you know even if it's at the bottom of the ocean you know so we don't really have I mean the Geiger right alien yeah. that was that was brilliant but that was ripping off ants right so uh, that was the last question now if you want to talk to him a little bit more he'll be at the meet and greet table out there everybody should know where it is but it's just to the right of the escalators past the elevators it's like the first table when you come across that. And then you can talk all you want until you tire him out and he tells you to go away.